Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. The praise, thanksgiving is only due to Almighty God, the only God, the one that created the heavens and the earth in the first place, the one who created the human beings, starting with Adam and his wife, and from them all of the nations that came forward. And we give all praise to him. The same praise that was given by Adam, Abraham, Isaac, and Ishmael, Moses, and David, and Suleiman, Jesus the Christ, peace and blessings be upon them all, and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. All of the ones that I just mentioned to us are the highest and the best of all of the people that ever walked on the earth. We immediately acknowledge that we couldn't, we're not even worthy to tie the shoes of these people. At the same time, we don't consider them to be gods or demigods or, you know, that we should worship them, but rather that we should follow them in their ways of how they worshiped. And this is a big thing to the Muslims. It's a very big thing to us. In fact, it's the very core, the essence of what Islam is all about is what we believe and what we do about our belief. This is why you find the Muslims being so strong around the world on the subject of adhering to the way Islam was understood 1400 years ago and not really being ready to make some major adjustments, if you will. This is not, uh, this doesn't fall on uh, the ears of those who are receptive to it because we realize that by changing things in a religion, it's not the same religion anymore. We also realize that it wouldn't be God's religion, it'd be man-made. And just as some atheists have a problem with man-made religions, also Muslims have the same problem. Because if it's from a human being, I can make up one too, you know. I can make up a religion. And I will promise you, just like if I make up a TV show, I want to be the star of the show. Hmm. Why not? If you get all the money, get all the fame and the glory, why not? So we're not interested really in following something that somebody made up. It's one of the things that we look for in Islam is proof. We want to see real proof. And not just talking about what we call scientific evidences, but rather the proof that we can find evidences from the Dalil, from I'm thinking in Arabic, that's not good, is it? Um, that we can rely on to know that what we're saying is correct. And in Islam, if we, are, if we don't know, we're commanded to be silent. Kala Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he told us, Man kana yukmanu bala wal yawmul akhir yaqulu khayr aw yasmut. Let the one who believes in Allah on the last day, if he can't say something good, don't say nothing at all. And you know, this, some of the sayings that you will hear from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, 1400 years ago, are popular even today in some European countries, here in America. And you might be surprised and think, wow, how did this man uh, hear about stuff that we say. Like, for instance, I'm from Texas, right? We say, Lord willing, and Greeks don't rise. That's a very famous saying. Uh, do you guys have that in Arkansas? Lord willing? You get that? Well, guess what? It didn't come from Texas. It didn't come from England. Because when it came, there was no Texas, and there was no England. 1,400 years ago, there was no England. How many of you didn't know that? You didn't know that. There was no English. That's a saying coming from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, because it was revealed in the Quran, because he said he was going to do something. I'm going to do so and so tomorrow or whatever. It was revealed to him then in the Quran, don't say you're going to do something unless you say, unless God wills. Lord willing. In an Arabic, inshallah. Let me see if you guys can say that. Inshallah. 
So this is going to be a good show, Inshallah. And we're going to have fun, Inshallah. And we're all going to be good Muslims and go to paradise, Inshallah. Uh, is that equal giving the shahada to everybody? Because I'm done then. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. We have some guests, some very special guests, and I wanted to take this opportunity to acknowledge our guests. You guys don't have to, you know, stand up and everybody point at you or anything, but we had one of our brothers drove all the way from Houston, Texas, my old stomping ground, grew up down there in Houston, and he came all the way up here to be with us. And come to find out, he has the same last name as me. So we're going to do some matching up of genealogy and these, uh, what do you call, uh, what do they call it? Not a, called a fruit tree. What is it called? <laughs> Family tree. Yeah. I was trying to make a joke. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> but for sure, we have other guests here as well. We've had some guests that came to us all the way from a place. It's called uh, Bentonville, Arkansas. And anybody ever heard of Bentonville, Arkansas? You heard of it? How many of you came all the way from there? Huh? How many came here from there? One, two, three, four, five, six. All right. And how many came from Texas? One, two, three, four, five? And wait a minute. Hold on. You guys are, some of you are raising your hand twice. I don't know. It's not Bentonville, Texas we're talking about. And how many, did anybody come from any other state? The state of confusion doesn't count, Shay. <laughs> Squish. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. We got from South Carolina. Sheikh is from South Carolina. We've got from, anybody here from Minneapolis? Where's our... Where's our, where did he go? Oh, 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 that's right. Yeah, he's from Manny Apples, the one that was right over here. Yeah. Uh, why did they call it that? I went there, I didn't find very many apples. I also didn't find very many sodas either. You know, these jokes will get worse if you don't laugh. <laughs> but do you mind if I talk about something? I, I found that here in Fayetteville, I was very proud of you guys. Not only do you have one of the best universities, I'm not joking, you've got some of the best talent here, but you also got an award for something that I think is amazing. One of the few of the cities in the world listed as a compassionate city. Compassion. That's a very special thing these days. You really don't see much of that. I'd like to call your attention to the opposite of it before I get into the talk, though. If you watch television, if you watch television, you should be watching Guidance TV, by the way. But uh, uh, by the way, our, our, our technician is back. So there's many apples and many sodas that are here, alhamdulillah, if you get hungry later. So on the TV these days, the things that used to have a lot of value are, like, not important anymore. How many of you heard of Bill Cosby? How many of you like his kids' shows that he did? Fat Albert, The Cosby Show, all that. You like it? I loved it. The stuff that he did, the work that he put into that, and what it stands for, is almost like a forgotten thing today. People don't care. Because it's... They say, well, it's not funny. Well, it wasn't supposed to be funny. It was supposed to be teaching us lessons, very valuable lessons, using cartoon things for the kids. And I had the distinct pleasure of meeting him just a couple weeks back. We flew together from uh, LA to San Francisco, I guess it was. And in just a few brief minutes, I was able to determine I like this guy because he has a character inside of him. And he said some things later that surprised me. In fact, I published it on our website today. You can see he's, got, he's in trouble, by the way, for saying it. 
But on our website called islamnewsroom.com, you can, uh, in fact, if you want to switch that over, you don't need to look at me. You can see in one of me is bad enough. Uh, there's a keyboard over there. If you'll do that. I will if you'll get over and do that. Yeah. Hit the escape key. And then just put Islam Newsroom up there and then hit the number one article. No, don't change it. There you go. All right. So, take a look at this. Now, folks at home, you're not going to be able to see this thing. Well, maybe you will because maybe you'll get back on it. You see it, you see it on there? The first one. Oh, that's that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got it. You got it. That's it right there. Go ahead and go up and go down on it. Go there you go. There you can see it now. Look what he said. I don't know if you, you're able to see it from there, but imagine that he said, I'm a Christian. That's the first thing he said. But we should be more like the Muslims. And right away, then... You know, all of the people that watch stuff on the internet and watch TV, and they're like, wow! And they want to attack him already. Why do you want us to be terrorists? But look what he said. Look, he talks about the values that Muslims have established, the importance of taking care of our children, not smoking, not drinking, not chasing after women, respecting women, the things that are a part of Islam, and he's talking about that. Now, that's what he mentioned. He didn't say anything about building bombs, doing terrorism, kidnapping. didn't talk about that. But he still winds up uh, on these various talk shows. They're saying, well, uh, blah, blah, blah. Maybe he's too old. You know, maybe he's senile. Stuff like this. Yet these are the same things that he's always stood up for his whole entire professional career. The very things that he's talking about, the things that he was re representing and presenting on television, he said that, and because there was the word Muslim involved, they discounted everything else he said. Now, I ask you, and I'm in a place where I know people understand the difference between right and wrong, and I'm in a place where people know that not everything you see on TV is exactly true. Is this the kind of future we could look forward to in journalism? If somebody says a wrong keyword, then everything else you, you don't like, everything else they say after that. Is that really what we want? Is that the future for America? If it is, then we don't have much of a future. Let's look at our Constitution, the Constitution of the United States. What is it that after they framed the, um, and I should probably give you some insight onto this. The people who framed the Constitution of the United States knew more about Islam than some of these journalists that are out here talking about it today. Did you know that? Does that surprise you? I was shocked when I heard about it. I didn't believe it, because I figured, you know, how could anybody in America know stuff that happened in Arabia? But as a matter of fact, Thomas Jefferson knew very much about it. He had a Quran translation, even back then. And it was translated by somebody who didn't even like Islam. But still, there was enough in there that he got the message from it. Thomas Paine, the one who actually drew up the Constitution itself, did the you know, writing of it and everything. I have a book, I carry it with me. The things that he said about Islam and about Muhammad Islam is amazing. I put something up on the screen a few minutes ago, but if you're watching this at home, you've probably seen it throughout the day because we've been running it yesterday and today will be something so different from what we're used to hearing on the internet and on the television that it almost shocks us. Like, really? How, how, where is this? Uh, I mean, you know, I know George Bernard Shaw. Everybody's heard of him. How did he know about Islam? How did he know about Muhammad? And everybody's heard about Gandhi. <laughs> if you didn't know that Gandhi was a Hindu, then you didn't know very much, you know? But yet, did you know that he read the Quran all the way through? Did you know that he read the life of Muhammad and he was disappointed in one thing? The fact that he didn't have more to read about it because he loved it. And he said that. 
And before he was assassinated by his own people, he said, I am a Muslim and a Christian and a Hindu. He was trying to be, you know, too many things to too many people. Maybe that's why they assassinated him. And before, again, before I get into our topic, I'll just tell you, it, it happened to me that I was coming back from Mexico one time, and they grabbed me at the border when I was coming in, took me aside. You know, that's, you, you heard about this before. It's called Random Lee. Yeah. I, Mr. Lee and I are becoming very well known together, Mr. Random Lee. And he take me aside, he says, so what kind of Muslim are you, is one of the questions. I'm like, what? Can you imagine that this would be something that you would come back from a trip somewhere and they'd take you aside and say, what kind of Christian are you? He'd say, get out of my face. I'm the kind that sleeps late and misses the... You know, but I show up for Christmas and, you know, what are you talking about? What kind of Christian am I? And they were saying, what kind of Muslim are you? I looked at this guy right in the face and I told him, well, I'm a fat Muslim. <laughs> but I'm trying to lose weight. I knew if I laugh, I'm going to be in bigger trouble. But I didn't laugh. I just looked at him. He said, no, 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 no. I don't mean that. I'm talking about, you know, like, what kind of Muslim are you? I said, old I can't do anything about that. He said, no, what type? I said, be positive. My blood type is. <laughs> and then I realized I'm going to be in trouble with this guy. Because he's going through his, his book. He's looking. He's, so he started naming off all of these sects. Uh, like Shiite is one, and Sufi is one, Ahmadian, Qadiani, Aga Khani. And there are all these long lists. And, uh, I'm listening to that, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to miss my connection for the flight, listening to him name off all of the stuff that me and some of the other guys actually put that book together years ago for the Bureau of Prisons. So I said, man, i got to do something quick now. <laughs> i got to get out of this mess. I said, I'm a Christian Muslim. <laughs> what was that? I said, well, you mentioned Hebrewish Muslim, right? Yeah. Well, I'm a Christian Muslim. Uh, uh, what is that? I said, well, I was a Christian, and I become a Muslim. He goes, oh, okay, you can go. <laughs> That's a true story, by the way. I'm not joking. The point what I'm trying to make is that when you put a name on something, when you put a label on something, you seem to get comfortable with that, that you already know everything about it. There's an example about this. There was a disease that came about about 20 odd years ago, maybe 30 years ago. And this disease, nobody had ever seen it before. They were scared. Everybody was worried and, uh, on the planet. There's this disease. We don't know what it is. We don't have a clue how you get it. We don't know how to get rid of it. But the people are dying from this thing. Everybody was worried about it. They described what was happening. What was happening to these people, they had no uh, immunity. Their the immune system was breaking down. And anything could kill them. And the slightest infection, bam, the guy's going to go down. And they would just gradually get worse and worse and worse and just die. Until somebody came out with a name it looks like these people are acquiring a deficiency for their immune system. So they call it what? Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. AIDS. Oh, OK, it's not got a name there. We're OK with it. It was no big deal anymore. It was still if anybody had it, and they raised money for it, and things like that. But it became like cancer or something like this. You could put it in your mind. Here's a, here's a label we can put on there, and we're OK with it now. So I wanted just to put a label, actually take a label off and look at it before we put it on, and understand something about what is Islam and how do we understand it from the point of view of compassion. Because first and foremost, for a Muslim, is all about their relationship. And literally, from the time we're born until the time we die, 
we have relationships with individuals, with our environment, and above all, our Creator. Earlier, we heard from chapter 55 of the Quran, Surah Ar-Rahman. A translation for that name could be the merciful, the gracious, or the compassionate. All of these fit under that same category. Because Rahma has compassion, it has mercy, and it has grace. Now we know in Christianity, especially if you're in the Bible Belt, about grace. We're talking about being saved by grace. How many did not ever hear of that? Let's put it that way. I won't ask you to raise your hand if you heard of it. You never heard of being saved by grace. Well, we've all heard of it. And without grace, we as Muslims know we wouldn't be saved. And that grace has to come from the all-gracious, the all-compassionate, the all-merciful, Ar-Rahman. So this is why we read that one for you, to let you reflect on it as we started the program. Next, I want to talk about the relationship that we have with ourselves. Because Islam is telling us even to take care of our own brain and take care of your spirit and take care of your body. It's not a suggestion, it's a commandment in Islam. Take care of yourself. Your body has rights on you. That's a statement translated from our prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Your body has rights. Can you imagine this? Some of the brothers who might get upset with me on this one, but that's okay. He even told us, give your beard its rights. <clears throat> Oops. Oh, Sheikh, uh, I didn't shave it off. I was just playing with a razor blade this morning. It just kind of like fell off. Yeah, right. Okay. Anyway, he told us to give your beards his right. Now, what it means is that you clean it, oil it. They use olive oil in those days. And comb it, brush it, and make it look nice. Your beard has rights. Can you imagine this? If the hair on my face has rights, how much more rights do the people have on me? And Islam insists that after Allah, Allah has the most rights on you, absolutely, because he created you, you have to give him rights, which is to say thank you to him. After that is the rights of the Prophet ﷺ, right? To follow Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and obey what he said to do. Because obedience... To the prophet is obedience to Allah. All right. Then after that, and somebody came to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Girls, pay attention now, because you're, you're coming up. You're gonna, we're going to hear, hear your voices. And remember, you don't have microphones. I do. So, and the folks at home need to hear you on this one. You ready? Setting you up, okay? Because Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked, after Allah and his messenger, who has the most rights on my companionship? And he said, oh, you got to do better than that. Who has the most rights on me after Allah and his messenger as far as companionship? Mother. Your mother. And then who? Mother. And then who? Mother. And then? Father. Your mother, your mother, your mother, and your father. So that proves you can have three wives, right? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> it was to put emphasis, why well, we're stressing this. One of the things that Bill Cosby was talking about is that the respect we have for women. At the time of Muhammad, there was no respect for women. You can't imagine, we've seen women mistreated, abused, even murdered, things like this. It is really bad. We've, we've seen it on TV. But imagine a society where it's considered really macho that when a girl is born into the family that they will take that newborn baby to the desert and bury her alive. And they used to do that. That's how much they put down women. They did not want women. They considered it a put down. And the women were treated on the level of or lower than animals. 
This story about having a harem full of plenty of women and all that kind of stuff is not from Islam. This is before. And they used to trade them away, sell them, give them away. Somebody comes stay at your tent overnight, right? Uh, you need a wife. Take that one. Uh, take two of them. Take, uh, you know what? Take that whole corner full of them. Get them out of here. So this is not the kind of compassion that we're talking about, is it? But when the prophet, peace be upon him, came, he laid it down real clear. Women have more than just rights. And he put who first? The mother. Because your parents have the most rights. This is, the, this is known. It goes back to the time of Abraham. We know about that. But he emphasized it by saying your mother, your mother, your mother, and your father. There's the most rights goes to them. So the relationship. And what kind of rights? It is to give them an ear when they want it. It is to support them in what they need. It is to be with them and take care of them when they get old. Even if they get Alzheimer's. Even if they have dementia. Even if they, what are they, what's that fancy way to say it? Incontinence? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I didn't even know what that meant until I watched TV. <laughs> what I'm saying, look, your parents took care of you. They changed your diaper. They took care of you when you couldn't even feed yourself. So now they become old, and what are you going to do? Our country is the number one in the world for putting away old folks. We got fancy names. We don't call them old folks' homes anymore. Huh? We call them retirement centers. <laughs> and they're expensive, too. We don't want to take care of our own relatives. We don't take care of our mom and our dad. And Islam insists on that. And if you said, yeah, but they don't even know. When my father got to that point when he had dementia so bad, he didn't even know where he was or who he was anymore. He fell, he broke his hip, but we took him to the doctor. The doctor told us, I have to advise you that it would, for your own benefit, your father is a big you know, burden upon your family, and he doesn't know anything anymore. If you just let him stay in the hospital, Usually, they will have pneumonia in a short period of time because they're laying down a lot and they'll pass away and then it'll be the end of it. I said, what'd you say? And he repeated it. I'm like, are you joking? He said, I have to tell you that. He said, but I know you're Muslim, so you'll probably say no to me. I said, no, I'll say, hell no. Nope, I forgot I'm on TV. Oops, scratch that out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's really sad. And he said, well, what is it? What? it? It's a burden for you guys. It's hard for your wife and you taking care of your father. I said, let me tell you something. My father took care of me. He said, yeah, but he doesn't know. He doesn't know anything. I said, but I do. And if God has given me the responsibility, then what if I'd have been somebody that like some children, you know, they're born and they have water on the brain or something, and all your whole life of that child, the parents have to take care of them. They can't do anything. The child can't even learn. You've seen that, right? But you don't throw them away. You understand what's called responsibility. So compassion is to show that responsibility more than give it lip service. It's to live up to it. And Islam is insisting on this. For the children, for the parents, for the family. Now, wait a minute, hold on. What if they're not Muslim? I mean, you know, come on. And I've heard some of our convert brothers and sisters say that. And you look at them and like, and what is your point? They're still your parents, yes or no? Regardless of what they believe or don't believe, they're still your parents. And they still have rights on you. And you must show them that compassion. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, made it real clear to us. Whoever doesn't show compassion won't be shown compassion. And Allah will not even look at those people on the Day of Judgment who couldn't show that compassion to their families, to their parents. So this is a very serious thing. This is very serious. You can have a lot of good deeds. Yeah? Lots of good deeds. You gave charity. You built a school for the children. You 
put up an orphanage. You went out and campaigned for all kind of good stuff. <clears throat> but then, on the Day of Judgment, you don't have a chance because of not fulfilling the priority. The priority is not to all the other people first, to your own parents. After that, your spouses. And again, and I'm, I'm not saying that Muslims are perfect in this, but we know that we have the responsibility to do it. When somebody come to me and tried to tell me, why did you go to Islam? You guys have to beat your wives. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> my wife is from Texas. <laughs> you don't even think like that. When we got married, her sister, this is a true story, her sister gave her an iron skillet about that big. Now we know what Teflon is, right? Well, why in the world would you give somebody an iron skillet? I asked her, what you gonna cook in there? She said, it ain't for cooking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but for somebody to say that Islam is encouraging this or even tolerating it, is to totally misunderstand the way of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, because he commanded in the khutbah of the the farewell sermon, he commanded the believers not to put their hands on their wives. So this is not something that you can just throw out here as, a, oh, I, I, I saw part of a verse in the Quran that said so and so in an English translation. Don't play that game with us. It doesn't work. It's not acceptable. A person has to take care of their spouses. The woman for her husband and the husband for his wife. After that, the children. Children have a very big role in Islam. And I've been in so many Muslim countries and so many Muslim homes and seen the beautiful way of the children. It's so amazing. And especially you go into Arab households. Now, how, anybody here ever been in an Arab household? You're an Arab, raise your hand. Anybody here from Saudi Arabia? Uh, there, now more hands went up. <laughs> Duh, hello. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. <laughs> and it's true, and I think for just one second, if you were in your home right now in Saudi Arabia, or UAE, or Qatar, or Bahrain, if you were there right now, and the elders were sitting around, what's the thing you'd want to do right now? Sit and read a magazine, play with your phone? No, you want to be the guy with the, the tea and the cups, right or wrong? You want that reward of going around and taking care of the guests, is that right? Look at this, look at this compassion that the Muslim has to have for the guests. If they have one sheep, one chicken, one egg, one carrot, one tomato, it doesn't matter. If you just have a little bit of something, they still would give it all to their guest. All. And not worry about what we'll have for our family tomorrow. That is the way of the Muslim with the guest. Is that right or wrong? And happy to do it. Is smiling, even knowing I'm going to have zero. Maybe you're fasting, huh? And you have somebody come over, and you give them the only food you had to break your fast with. That happened. That happened at the time of Aisha, radiallahu anha. The wife of the Prophet, she was fasting. The servant girl or whatever was with her said somebody is at the door. It came, and... Uh, he wanted some charity. Said, all we got is this barley. You were going to break your fast with the barley. You know what barley is, yeah. She said, give it to him. What? You give, you give, now why are you going to break your fast? Said, Allah take care of us. And just before it was time to break the fast, a man in the community who never donated anything before ever came over and donated a whole sheep. Or a goat. I think it was a goat. And Aisha said to her, now see, isn't this better than the barley? Because we understand that the compassion we have is not going unnoticed by our Creator. What we're doing, Allah will take care of us. He will take care of all of us 
And he's the only one going to take care of you anyway. Whatever you have didn't come by. Do you, did you invent? No. You acquired it, but bottom line, it, everything came from a law. All right. Now let's come down to something else. Well, what about, you talk about guests. What about neighbors? How many of you honestly know all your neighbors? Anybody knows all their neighbors? All your neighbors? Ten houses away? In any direction? How about 20 houses away in any direction? How about 30 houses in any direction? Huh? The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, listen, to, listen carefully, brothers and sisters. This is everybody. I'm talking about brothers and sisters in humanity. Listen carefully. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said something that should scare all of us. He's not a believer who can fill his stomach and go to sleep at night while his neighbor's stomach remains empty. And somebody came up to him and said, well, who's my neighbors? You know, give me a clue. He said, Al-Arba'in. Arba'in. Forty in any direction. Forty in any direction. Wow. Talk about compassion. Don't fill up your stomach till you make sure everybody else has food. And if you say, well, some of these things are a little bit hard to live up to. And I, I agree with you. I agree with you. But I'll tell you what. When I heard that, I started taking care of at least the neighbors in the area where I was. When we used to be in Texas, at the time of the end, the last day of Ramadan, you know, the next day they have the, the what do you call the Eid al-Fitr, and they bring the rice and they bring the staples and things to give to the poor. We used to go and distribute it. First thing I would do is take it around to all of my neighbors. Then we have another one, Eid al-Adha. We have the meat from that in the celebration, and I would go around and give it to all the neighbors. And one time, my neighbor came over to me. His name was Stoney. He came over and he said, hey, are you guys going to have any more celebrations soon? <laughs> <laughs> this giving is an amazing thing. I was telling one of our brothers today, when I got married to the wife I have now, and I noticed that we went out to eat, and she left a tip that was about 25% of the value of the food that we ate. And I eat at cheap joints, you know, because I'm trying to save money, you know. And here she gets, I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You didn't mean to leave that much. She said, yes, I did. $10? She said, yeah. Why? She said, because this is due to those people who are waiting on me, serving me. If I want to stay home and cook and wash dishes and serve and do all of that, I'll get reward for it. I'm trying to buy back some of the reward. Because this person's taking care of me. I was like, mm-hmm, yeah, right. Uh, but in the back of my mind, still had that little stinginess, you know what I'm saying? Next thing I know, within a couple weeks, there's a lady she's bringing into our mosque, into the masjid, to know about Islam. The lady entered Islam. And it wasn't long, we had another and another. And it turns out that these ladies talking to each other about those Muslim people over there, they're generous. Do you understand? Because you do it from sincerity. Now, you can't buy people into Islam, but when you are genuinely compassionate with people, they feel it and they know it. Since I learned that, and I learned it from her, since I see that and know that, I try my best when I go to other places to always take time to acknowledge that somebody is doing a good job at what they do, encourage them to do more, and if I can give them something, I try to give them something. Even if it's a bumper sticker or a ballpoint pen or something, and you know, I've had so many people follow up with me later and send me an email or a phone call 
or you know, text me on the what do you call the uh, on the Facebook thing. What do they call it? Liking or want to be a friend on it. And then we talk and we talk, and then the next thing you know, the person is coming to Islam. And it doesn't come by debating with people about whether or not Jesus is a god. It doesn't, no, it doesn't. That, that really doesn't impress me to do those kind of debates. I didn't like it before I come to Islam, and I don't like it now. I know there are people very good at that, and that's what they do. May Allah guide all of us. But for me personally, I would much rather talk about what do we have in common first, and then when we come to the differences, if what you have is better than my opinion, I want then what you have. And it should be the other way, reciprocal too. Because if we're honest, and we really are, that we want to go to paradise, and we really do, if you know a shortcut, tell me. But let's be sure it's a real shortcut. Let's don't play a game. Let's not talk about dreams and feelings. Let's don't talk about hunches and, and toasty, warm feelings that you get from something. No, I, wa I want to see, give me something that I can rely on, and I'm ready to go. I'm ready to give up what I have for something better any time, especially when it comes to going to paradise in the next life. In fact, that's what opened up the subject for me to come to Islam. I thought I was doing somebody a big favor. I met a man from Egypt, and I thought that I needed to convert him to be a Christian. So much so that I was willing to give my time and energy. And my father said he was going to do business with him anyway. And I said, okay, let me think how I can convert this guy. First thing my father said was, leave him alone. He has his religion. We have ours. And we are friends. Leave it alone. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> But when we began having these discussions, and we did, we had, I was the one bringing them all up, right? I would notice that he would be so quiet and peaceful about things, I couldn't get him riled up, you know? Three months later, I found that I was entering into Islam. There's a long story about it. You can find it on the internet, yusufestis.com, if, you if you care about the story. But what's important is, that this man had compassion. In spite of the fact that, that I was a jerk, I didn't see it at the time, but I was really, you know, when you, you know, I don't know, has anybody ever walked up and said, have you found Jesus? I didn't know you lost him. <laughs> when I was a Christian, I didn't like to hear that stuff, you know. A, that's between me and, and the Lord, you know. Why, why are you getting my face over that? So when, when somebody is pushing a religion, it, it doesn't work. It sounds like it's a used car. It's a lot better, let me see how you act with the people. Compassion, it's a word in the dictionary. It is. But there's a lot of words in the dictionary. Some of them I can't even pronounce, some of them I can't even spell. But when we see an act, maybe we don't know the right word for it, but we know we like it. We like what we see, and we enjoy being with those kind of people. That makes all the difference in the world. I was on a trip one time. I was overseas, um, Denmark, I think. Yeah, back in the early 70s. And of course, I wasn't a Muslim in those days, but. I saw this one man, he didn't smoke, and I have an allergy to smoke, a really bad allergy. And everywhere that I saw him, I knew I could go and be safe because he'd always look for places where there would be no smoke. We were riding on a bus one day there in Denmark, and I asked him, I said, are you allergic to smoke too? He said, no. He said, it's just my religion. I said, really? I noticed you don't drink either. He said, that's also my religion. I said, oh, well, that's good. And Denmark, in those days, was called the porn capital of the world, okay? And he and I also didn't get involved in that stuff. So I asked him, I said, what religion are you? And he told me he was a Mormon. Because of this person, I took the Book of Mormon and began to read it. Didn't become a Mormon, but at least I read it. 
And I would have never done that if he'd have walked up and said, hey, you ought to be a Mormon, here's the book. I would have said, hey, all right, get out of here. Today we met a man, just before we came over here, that's why we're a little bit late getting here. The man who was taking care of us at the place where we ate was very interested in what we were doing. He was even thinking about how he could take off from work to come over here to be with us today. And you know how it all started? By being compassionate. Now, I'd eaten there yesterday, and he saw me, he even got my name. So when I walked in the door today, he called me by my name. And then he said, I wish I could go. Are you going to give a speech? That's what he said. I said, yeah, well, I didn't tell him any of this. He figured it out. Now, if I don't take the time to talk to him, if I don't take to show compassion to a person, then why would they care about anything that I said? I would like, really, for the people of America to have a chance to visit some of the homes and businesses that I've seen in other parts of the world. Not just Muslims, but other people, and see that really there's a lot of good people out here. We have a lot of good people left in the world. And not everybody is like these sitcoms that you see on TV. We're sitting here all together and we're talking and then somebody leaves the room and as soon as they leave, everybody has to say something bad about them, make fun of them. Now in the sitcoms, they make fun of people right in front of their face. Did you know there's an ayah in the Quran, a verse in the Quran that forbids us to ever, ever say anything about anybody? Did you know that? It's forbidden. It's chapter 49, Surah Al-Hujurat. It goes to the extent, first of all, telling us in one verse, don't let a group of women insult another group of women. It might be the one that's being insulted is better than they are. And don't let a group of, next verse, don't let a group of men insult another group of men. It might be that they are better than they are. But then it comes to a specific case, and it says, and it forbids us to do something called riba. How many of you heard about this? Over half the room, mashallah. Ghiba, which we call in English backbiting. Backbiting. Did you ever wonder where the expression came from? 1400 years ago, it's in the Quran. You would hate to eat the flesh of your dead brother. So, in the same way, you should hate ghiba. Backbiting. And it, it, to spell it out, now you said, well, maybe it just means that, maybe, no, no, no. They asked the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, about this. They said, yeah, but what if we're saying about this guy is true? He said, that's what it is. If it's true, that's backbiting. If it's not true, it's even worse, it's a lie. And you, you've heard people say, well, I'll say that to his face. You heard that before? I'll say it to his face. Which means what? Because Prophet, peace be upon him, he said, it's anything a person would not like to have said about them, and that's whether or not they're there or not. So, if somebody is known as the short person, they say, well, the short one, okay. And they, they, it's a common term. You're not making fun of the guy, it's this short guy. Or if somebody's skin is very dark, this black guy, okay, it's fine, because you're not saying that to insult them. Well, then, like in my case, if somebody said the real handsome guy from Texas, <laughs> I wouldn't care. No. <laughs> uh. <laughs> They're giving me the sign. We've got to wrap this up pretty quick. So I want to come back to this compassion. It extends beyond human. It goes to the animals. Our prophet, peace be upon him, got very upset with people who would overburden their animals and load them up with too much or not feed them or not give water to them. He even said that uh, one lady who was a prostitute, but she had compassion. Listen to this. She had so much compassion. And when she saw a dog starving, drooling, he, he, he had no saliva even, she went into a well to get water for herself. And I don't know if you've been in a well. You climb down. It's very scary. And when she came out, she realized this dog was in worse shape than her. 
she went back down again, filled up her, they have what they call slippers, it, it's like a little booty, fill it up with uh, water and gave it to the dog. Because of what she did, Allah forgave her and put her in paradise. Another lady, listen to this one. This other lady, she is, oh, praying all the time and, you know, yeah, Mrs. Righteous, you know, you, you got them in the neighborhood, right? <laughs> but she's righteous, oh yeah. But she had a cat, and she chained it up so it couldn't even get out to catch any food or anything, and it died, starvation. And because of this, all of her good deeds and her worship, Allah didn't accept it and put her in the hellfire. Because no compassion. Compassion, compassion, compassion. I'm using an English word. I like the Arabic word even better. Let me tell you why. Because it has a richer meaning. Raham. Raham. From Rahma is Raham. What is Raham? Who knows what's Raham? Yes. Why he did this? No, it doesn't mean a beer belly. It means what? It's the place inside of the mother where she conceives. In English, if you said a uterus or a womb, it's like clinical terms, you know, but in Arabic, it's a beautiful term. The place of mercy. You were conceived in mercy, and you grew in mercy inside of your mother. You were delivered in mercy, and you always have, a child always has Allah's mercy, which brings us to the next step. How many of you heard the expression, somebody is as innocent as a newborn baby? You heard that? It was our prophet, peace be upon him, who said every child is born innocent in a fitra of al-Islam, which means total submission. Islam means submission. It means surrender. It means sincerity. It means a wholeness. And it means obedience. And it means peace. And this is every child. Look what he said. He said every child is born on this. It doesn't matter the religion of the parents. The child is born innocent. And any child who dies goes to paradise. Put yourself in the position of a priest or a minister or a, an imam who works in the institutions like Sheikh and I used to do. And you get the bad news that somebody's loved one has passed away, and it's a child. You have to go to them and tell them, your child is dead. And then the person will say, because they're, they're shocked. When, when a child dies, it's a big shock. You can imagine an old person dying, okay. But a baby, come on. And they will ask, almost rhetorically, where is my child? Where did my child go? Did my child go to heaven? How would it be for somebody in the clergy to have to ask, well, what religion are you? Because that's what they do. You're not a Catholic? Well, we better get you a Protestant preacher over here and he can talk to you. As far as we're concerned, we're not going to say that, but... And I promise you, that as a Muslim, clergy, Sheikh and I would never have that problem because you, you, your child passed away. For sure the child went to paradise. There's not a doubt in our mind. Your child's in paradise, and here's a bonus. The child is there saying, until the day of judgment, let my parents be with me. Let my parents be with me. Let my parents be with me. Ask yourself, what makes more sense? What makes more sense? The compassion that we're talking about, the love that we're talking about, has to be demonstrated. And where is the Muslim guilty? And we're guilty. The Muslim is guilty because when you go into the non-Muslim countries, you have some tendency to shy away, to not want to bring the beauty of Islam out, almost like you want to copy the way of the people around you. And you already know that they're lacking. They already, they're very, uh, this, where we are right now is high education. The Institute of Higher Education, you can't top this place where we are. But when it comes to these things of compassion, I'm sorry, we, we lost a lot of that.
We've been through some wars. We've been through some rumors of wars. And we've had some problems here. We need some compassion. We need some love. And when we don't see it from some people, then we feel like, well, maybe you're part of the problem. That's what's happening. I want to encourage all of my viewers at home and those of you that are here with us right now, I want to encourage you to stop and think for just a minute. How do you want other people to treat you? How do you want other people to treat you? Just think about that for just one second. How do you want your mom and dad to treat you? How do you want your brothers and sisters to treat you? Your children, how do you want them to treat you? Many times I've said, when people ask me, give me advice, Chef, I tell them, remember how you treat your parents. Allah is going to give you children to treat you the same way. And our prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, he told us, prefer the needs of your brother over your own needs. Not even up, not do unto others as you have them, do unto you. No, no. Prefer their needs over your own needs. And when you reach that level, then you're talking about rahmah. Then you're talking about something very beautiful, the real compassion of Islam. And until next time we can be together again, don't go away because we've still got more programs coming right up here on Guide Us TV. Guess what's coming next? Aha! Salam alaikum. Too late, we went off the air. All right, this program is still on right now. We're not done. That was, we have to go off on, on cue on the uh, camera. But the rest of what we want to talk about in the compassion now is the compassion that we have for our enemies. I'm sorry we couldn't put this on, but we ran out of time. But this is something so amazing that when people hear it, they shake their heads and go, I couldn't do that. A Muslim is ordered not to fight anybody who is not fighting you. That's clear. It's in the Quran. You cannot engage in any kind of combat unless they are combating you. But if they combat you, look at this. It's in the Quran. You cannot exceed what they do to you. If they're shooting arrows, you can't throw atom bombs on them. Did you know that? It says it. That's what it says. You cannot do more than what they're doing. I hope nobody ever shoots arrows at me because I can't shoot one of those things. Just stop and think. But then it goes further. And if they stop, you have to stop. Now ask yourself, be honest. If you were fighting against a group and they're fighting against you, they just killed your best friend, killed your uncle, killed your cousin, right? But then they stopped. You'd be like, this is my chance. You're dead meat, right? No, you can take them as a captive. Yeah, you can do that. But you cannot slaughter that person. And another one. Listen to this one. A man was fighting. One of the Muslims was fighting a guy. And either the man lost his sword or it broke or something like this. He was about to kill him. And he said, I'll translate. He said, I bear witness there is only Allah to worship and Muhammad is his messenger. This, the Muslim killed him. And the story got back to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And he became very upset. He said, how come this man says the thing that enters into Islam and then you killed him? He said, he only said it. He only said it because he was afraid I was going to kill him. He said, did you open his heart and see? Do you know what was in his heart? And the man said, I wished I had not entered Islam yet so I could start over. Because it's very serious in Islam. Another one, and this happened at the time of Ali, radiallahu anhu, they were in a battle. Now, Ali is the cousin of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And Ali, by the way, is one of the very first person to enter Islam, even though he's like nine years old. He was one of the very first people to accept this message. He was fighting. And when he got up close, and the one he's fighting, his sword broke or he dropped something like that, and Ali was about to kill him. And the man spit on him. 
<laughs> Spit on him. Oh, there's my motivation. <laughs> and Ali didn't kill him. And the man said, hey, are you going to kill me? He said, no. And then, now look at this. The guy goes, why? I mean, I wouldn't have asked that. I just said, okay, thank you, bye. He said, why? He said, because if I would have done it before, I would have been doing it for Allah. But now I would be doing it for myself, and that's forbidden in Islam. We have to have compassion even for our enemies. And in war, in, there's so many things that if you study the real Islam, you'll realize that they always offered first two things. First of all, if you would like to enter Islam, you'll be a part of our nation and we'll work together. If you would not like to enter into Islam, then be at peace with us. We'll run things, but you'll still have a share in everything, but Islam will run this area. And if they don't accept that and they want to fight, then they fight them. But can you imagine? Another thing that we see in the compassion today, I'm going to end with this one. And I have seen this so many times because I, I, I visited prisons here in this country. That was my job. But when I went overseas and I, I got a chance, did you go with me when we were in Curacao to that prison? You remember? You didn't go to the prison though, right? When you see the prisons in other countries, they're pretty rough. Not like nice like we got here. I don't know if some of you have ever been in prison or not. I hope you don't go, but still, over here, especially in the federal units, are palaces compared to stuff that you see in other countries. But when I was in the Muslim countries, I found not only, and I visited in Saudi Arabia and in Qatar and in, uh, uh, no, um, UAE, United Arab Emirates. Not only was everything clean, like we have here in the federal units, and organized, regimented, but people were treated with respect. And that surprised me, because you don't see that kind of respect. I mean, the inmate's the inmate. They even have it so that if a person will correct their character and work on their behavior, modification, and they have to do a lot on their own. They're not, gonna, they're not gonna like put pills in you to make you a nice guy. But if you work on that and you will memorize the Quran, they will cut off some of the served, uh, like served time. And a person that could have 10 years could be out in three years. But they're going to watch him really close because they don't want him to get back in again. And that's the biggest problem that we have over here, isn't it? The inmate gets out and, and forget about religion, okay? They'll be the nicest Christian or the nicest Muslim. But when they get back in the streets, they get with their old buddies. They hang out. They get back into drugs, back into stealing and uh, all the rest of it. Boom, they're right back again. Only for a longer time now because they broke probation on top of it. So this is, or break parole. The, this is something very nice. Imagine that somebody would be in prison, but because they change their behavior, they show compassion, and they, they, sometimes they have them work with animals, sometimes they have them help projects. They, they have to work. But when they get out, they help them get a job doing the same thing, to continue and help them. I'm saying that if the whole world had more compassion, it'd sure be a lot better place for all of us. And if the Muslims, and I'm sorry to have to attack us, but if we would just bring that out into the open and show more compassion, more patience, more sabr, I think that it would be a better place. Let's end now with the, one of the smallest of all of the chapters of the Quran. One, because it's easy for me to remember it. Number two, because it really has a lot of kick. It has a lot of very potent information in it. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لا في خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتوصوا بالحق وتوصوا بالصبر 
In these few verses, God Almighty, the only creator and sustainer of this universe, has revealed to us a big solution to our purpose in life. He says that he swears by the passage of us, of time. And we don't even know what time is. We think we do. If you're watching your favorite game on TV, it goes by in a heartbeat. But if you're sitting at a red light, it seems like forever. And Allah is swearing by time. That all of his creation of the human beings, lafi khusr, are in bankruptcy. That's why it says loss, if you've seen the translations. Khusr is bankruptcy, bankrupt. Can't pay. And on the day of judgment, they can't pay up. No good deeds. Illa, except for those. Ladina, except for those. Who come to the iman, the right belief and faith, and they do the mu'amala, the deeds of righteousness. So in Islam, I'm, I'm going to digress for a minute, and let you think about this. In Islam, faith without works is dead. And that's a quote out of the book of James in the Bible. Faith without works is dead. And as far as having faith with no works, what is that anyway? Think about it. And then what about the works without faith? The person is so nice, so good. We've seen people like this. Well, they don't believe in God at all. But they're nice. They're so nice. Well, if they don't believe in God, then why'd they do it? What was the motivator? What was the motivator? Well, I just wanted to be a good human. Well, get your reward from the humans. If that's really what you thought, or maybe you did it so people would say good things about you. And we know the story about those three who come on the Day of Judgment. The one who said that he used his life to fight for the sake of God as a martyr. And he'd be told, no, you did it so people would say you were a great fighter. And they said it. And the one who said, well, I was the one who made all the money, but I gave it all away in charity for your sake. No, you did it so that people would say you were generous. And they said it. And the one who said, well, I got this knowledge of the religion so I could pass it on as a scholar. No, you wanted people to say you were an alim. And they said it. And all of them be dragged on their face into the hellfire. So it is both. You have to have the right faith and you have to have the right actions. Aminu wa amilu salihat. Wa, it means and. And, so it's not done yet. There's some more required here. Tawasso, to encourage, exhort, and push each other to the haq, to the ultimate truth, to work toward calling people to this same belief. And tawasso, exhort, encourage, exhort each other to what? To be in perseverance and patience. Those are the qualities required for the person to succeed on the day of judgment. Not just by faith alone, not just by deeds alone. Faith and acceptable deeds, and all through it is compassion. I want to use the word Rahma again, <laughs> because that's the word that we use in Arabic. Ar Rahman, Allah is the compassionate. Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim. I want to end with this last little bit here. Some of the Muslims. Don't know this, so I need to share this. I heard it from good scholars. Why is it that all of these surahs have the beginning, Bismillah, in the name of Allah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim? All of them. There's one that doesn't, chapter 9, but it's in another uh, surah. So it's equal to the number of chapters. Now, why Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim? Why is that? Why didn't you say Ar-Rahman or Ar-Rahim? Why? Why? Because it's the same word. It's a different pronunciation of the same word. Almost, almost like the same, but not quite. 
One is more specific than the other. And the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ explains it really good. They were walking along one day, Abdurrahman bin Sakhar and the Prophet and some others. And he tells us that the Prophet ﷺ asked about a lady. She had a new baby. She had a brand new baby. He said, would this lady let that baby fall in the fire? Oh, no way. A baby? No way. No mother's going to let the baby fall in the fire. He said, this is from the Rahmah of Allah. This is from the Allah's Rahmah. I'm not going to use any other word in English because it's too, it's too limiting. The Rahmah of Allah is for every mother, for every child. For all of the Rahmah, from all the creation, that there is any Rahmah, it's from Allah's Rahmah, a Rahman. And Allah has 100 parts of Rahmah, and only one of the 100 went for the universe. The other 99 parts of Allah's Rahmah is waiting for the true believers on the Day of Judgment. And there's where you understand how we use the word grace. Because nobody is saved except by this Rahmah. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said that. Nobody will enter the paradise. Nobody will enter the paradise except by grace. Except by Rahmah. They said, even you? He said, even me. None is saved except by the Rahmah of Allah. And I hope that those words are having an impact on the one speaking those words right now. Because the worst thing in the world is to say the things that I just said and then not live up to it. I'm reminding myself more than anybody else here. Our prophet, peace be upon him, told us, Allah is gonna start the fire of hell with Muslims. Scholars, Muslim scholars. He'll start the fire of hell with them. Because they preached it, but they didn't live it. So may Allah make us of those people who live the Rahmah, the compassion, the love, the mercy for each other. And Allah make us of those people who demonstrate it with our lives rather than express it only with our mouths. Ameen. Zakum Allah khair. I love all of you for the sake of Allah. And I ask Allah to guide each and every one of us and make us of those people qualified to receive his rahmah on the day of judgment. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Zakum Allah khair. May Allah reward you, Shaykh.